Uh, mediators who are not attorneys, they do need to be legal document preparers if they are going to prepare documents for their clients. Um, I think the other thing that people probably should look for in a mediator, at least it's something that I think is important, is that the person um, carry liability insurance so that uh, you can feel that they are committed to making sure their clients are happy and that if you are unhappy with um, something that comes out of the mediation and something disastrous should happen, which I don't think I've ever heard of happening in a mediation, but um, you would have the ability to complain in some sense and to get satisfaction potentially. The question I always very often get asked when I'm mediating cases is, you know, how long is it going to take, how much it's going to cost? And I, don't, I know we can't, so I always feel a little uncomfortable talking about costs because it varies too much, but can you give us some sense that maybe on, uh, at least on how long, how long it takes and how often you meet with the couples? I meet with the people in my office in two-hour sessions. Um, mostly because after two hours people get tired and they start making decisions that they wish they hadn't and uh, the goal is that they are making an informed decision and a consensual decision, not a decision because they're exhausted. And so I meet with them weekly in a two-hour mediation session. Most of my clients are out of my office in between two and five mediation sessions. So that's a total time frame of, you know, between you know, four and ten hours. And that is uh, very, very different than the litigation process. Of course, some cases take longer and they're more complicated. And some, every now and then, I had one last week where they came in and they were there one time. They knew what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. They had a very simple situation. They sat down, they worked it out, and they left. That's good. I mean, I still remember one doing a case once that I, when I was mediating once where the, in one week I had people come in and sign it and they had done the whole thing in six weeks and the other couple, the appointment later in the afternoon was, was the, after two years. Yeah, so it right. really, I think it goes back to what you were saying, I think, about empowering the couple. They're in control. And I think we also try to educate people about uh, the issues that they need to make decisions on. And so um, we'll give them all sorts of information um, about the applicable um, tax information, the applicable Arizona law, applicable um, information on which issues really, you know, need to be resolved in order to make it less likely that they're going to have to come back years later when something comes up that was unexpected, whether it's children going to college, you know, you don't want a couple to have to come back two or three years later and say, gee, we never thought about what we would do about our children's college education, and now we want to mediate that. Uh, as mediators, you know, we call their attention to what would they like to do about children's education. And uh, we don't advise them ever what to do, but we inform them as to uh, the issues that really they ought to think about. When you talk about information, what kind of information does, does, would we expect a couple to have to bring to you in order to do the mediation, Marie? Well, I need them to bring the information if it's a divorce that we're talking about, about their community assets and their community debts. And, and I rely sometimes on outside experts to help get information. About half my clients are represented by lawyers when they come to the mediation process and they rely on their lawyers for legal advice. They also use CPA uh, if there's tax issues because I'm not a CPA and I want to make sure that they have the information that they need. Sometimes there's a business evaluator involved or uh, somebody to uh, appraise their home. So it's about getting the information in the best way possible. You mentioned the attorneys, and one of the questions I've heard over the years is people say, well, you know, they see a mediator, and they see two attorneys, and they say, oh, gee, I'm, I now have three people instead of two people. It's going to cost me more. So what is the, really the role of, of, I think it's referred to as review counsel in this situation in, in, a, in a mediated case? What's, what do attorneys do here that is differently, different than they would do in an adversary case? Well, I think they're advisors and counselors, like, like they are. They, they're used to... to individually give their client information and advice to help them make a decision in mediation. Does that sort of uh, confuse or make the process more difficult? I don't think so. I think I it's think very, it's very best. helpful because I think clients need to feel comfortable with the decisions they're reaching 
And in order to do that, they have to be informed. And since the mediator is a neutral and is not going to give advice, it's very, very important to have someone out there who is going to give advice so that there are no you know, cases of buyer's remorse afterwards. And I, the thing that I always find amazing uh, anyway is that there is what I call sort of Greek chorus advising people in divorces anyway. Their family, their friends who love, you know, each party in the divorce advising them on what would be good to do. And so it's a very good idea to have a person who's an expert, that attorney who has dealt with divorces on a frequent basis, giving advice and not just relying on family and friends who don't have that professional experience. Um, what's the people who get you get the mediation process and you've resolved all the issues? What happens next? When they've reached an agreement, and, and almost everybody does. Almost everyone who tries mediation. You have the magic touch, oh, That's Marie. right, obviously. You have the magic touch. I think not right. me. What I do? think that mediation has a very high success rate, you know, period, as a process, partially because the people who are coming are self-selecting. They know that they do not want to spend their life savings in two, three years getting divorced, and that they want their family and their, you know, to continue to function even if they're not married, to continue to co-parent. And um, they are working very hard to try and, try and get their case resolved. And so, you know, they get all the credit, really, you know. So what happens at that point? Is, once you come to the agreement, you then write it you down. Come. You write it down in black and white so that later on, when they're not getting along so well, they can go back and say, when we were calm, we talked about this. And let me see what I said. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I was going to have them on Thanksgiving. You know, they, we write it down as clearly as possible at, so that they have a road map for their future. And what about, I don't want to go too much because we're going to do other shows, but what about actual going to court and getting the, the documents to go to court? What happens with that? Well, at this point, um, Arizona has uh, a wonderful option for people, which is that they don't have to go to court. They can, in fact, mail in their agreement in the form of their consent decree and uh, they can avoid having to spend a lot of time in court. And so um, the documents can be prepared by an appropriate professional, whether it's a legal document preparer or it's the attorney or it's the mediator or you know whoever the couple chooses. And the documents can be sent into court. Um, and so that makes uh, it a lot easier than if couples had to take time off from work. Do you think there's to to a court. benefit to going to court, though, at all? I think there's some benefit, but I think that uh, in mediation, at the point at which people sign an agreement, they obtain that same benefit. I think that there is um, some closure that people get at that point of signing. And I think that during the mediation process, what makes mediation, I think, so good is that people really have the sense that they've been heard. And by the time they sign, they no longer need that sense of closure uh, or being heard that a judge saying you're divorced, you know, uh, gives people. That's good. Um, I think you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the person's impartial, the media has to be impartial in doing what they do. Um, but I also wanted to ask you about how this whole process affects children. What, how do, do you find the mediation affects children versus adversary divorce, for instance? Well, a, a few years ago, there was um, a task force uh, established in Connecticut which looked at the effects of divorce on children. And what the task force discovered was that the longer the process took, the worse the impact on children. And so I think that mediation, since it's speedier, is better for children. But also, in mediation, at least I always, as a mediator, am very conscious of the children being in the room even though they're not in the room. And so I see myself, in some sense, as protecting their interests. You have a little anecdote about that, don't you, and, uh, about well, the children I, in the room? Well, sometimes um, I encourage people to bring in photos of their children because it makes the presence of the children very real without obviously subjecting children's to, children to adult issues, which I think is highly inappropriate. Um, and so it keeps everyone very focused to have pictures of their children, you know, in front of them. And what is going to happen in uh, 
a couple that has children, they're going to have to continue to parent these kids together. And so crafting something in mediation is very, very helpful. And just learning how to talk to each other in mediation benefits children because the